he is not from security engineer. So you have 30 minutes. Shall we start? So first of all, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming this afternoon. I'd like to thank LACNIC and the program committee for the opportunity of making this presentation. Today, I will be making a presentation on the implications of IPv6 addressing on security operations. On one hand, this will be a super simple presentation and quite obvious. But as we see in the motivation, the objective of the reason why I propose this is that when working with different organizations, what in theory seemed quite obvious was not such in practice. So the idea is to try and may provide recommendations or uh, suggestions regarding how to carry out security operations with IPv6. So motivation, I mentioned this already. What is the motivation of this talk? So this has to do with the IPv4, IPv6 differences. Many of you are aware of these because you're probably working with organizations where you see this firsthand. But there are many cases, for example, in security teams, and others where this does not seem so obvious. They work, they focused in other areas, not necessarily in networking and IPv6. So the differences regarding the two protocols and even more the implications are not so obvious. Obviously, what these teams normally do is to try and migrate IPv6 to implement in IPv6 the same practices they applied for IPv4. So that is quite reasonable or expected. So we try to apply the knowledge we have. Now the problem with this is that these practices not necessarily work with IPv6. There's nothing terrible about this. You don't need to be allowed, but we have to bear in mind the things that we will be mentioning to see what we have to change when we do security operations. So this presentation was motivated when having talks with teams in different organizations, the security teams or network operators. So let us start with some background information because in my introduction, I mentioned different concepts, security operations, differences between the two protocols. So before going into the core of the presentation, we need to agree on what we refer to when we speak about security operations and the two protocols. So the first point is what are we speaking of when we speak about security operations? This, of course, is an oversimplification. So the idea is to clarify the problems at hand. So consider two activities that we normally do when we are in a security team. For example, to enforce the allow lists or the correlation of the network, the network activity correlations. Now, what are the access control lists? We have the allow list where we intend to provide access to a resource, to a system or a group of given systems, normally to reduce the sur attack surface. And on the other hand, we have the block list, which is the other way around. We want to block access to a given resource to a system or a group of specific systems. Now, this normally done is done by the security, but also the network teams work on these types of or issues. Another group of normal operations or routine operations for security teams is what we call network activity correlation. What do we mean by this? I detect in some part of my network malicious and legitimate attacks. So looking in different platforms or in different blogs, I try to correlate certain activities in such a way in order to conclude or 
see if these were carried out by the same attack or system. So a security team in operations does much more than this, of course. But I just took two of these areas in order to discuss the problem at hand. So in this case, we will agree on what we are referring to when we speak about security operations. In one of the first slides, when I spoke about the motivation, I referred to the differences between the two protocols. And what, would you, what do we mean when we speak of differences? We're going to speak about differences in addressing. So this will be the focus of my presentation. We have differences regarding the properties of the addresses in IPv6. We have each address has a whole set of properties. For example, the address scope, we'll have global addresses, we'll have private addresses, and then we'll have stability properties. Some are stable, some have a short life, other are temporary. And we'll also have intended usage. Some addresses are configured for outgoing communications and others are only used for incoming communications. Now, normally, we have addresses that combine these different properties. For example, global temporary addresses or stable or temporary addresses, etc. Now, a specific feature of the IPv6 world and this is different from the IPv4 world, is that the IPv6 systems normally used multiple addresses simultaneously. So normally when people start experiencing IPv6, are surprised by this point. So we have one same system for our same interface. We use multiple addresses with multiple properties or combinations. On the other hand, another specificity of IPv6 is that normally the systems control a large address block, normally a slash 64. They use uh, what we call self-configuration or auto-configuration. So the systems have the freedom to choose from a slash 64 the address they wish to configure. What else can we say? Well, when we work or carry out security operations like the ones we mentioned earlier, implement access control lists or correlating activities. This is closely linked to the semantics or to the things that an IPv6 address identifies or an IPv6 prefix. So I look at a log in a platform, a given activity originated by an IPv6 address, and then I see another activity originated by the same IPv6 address. And the question is, can I conclude that this is the same system? So it is important to reassess or to rethink all this. Now, the first issue is that multiple addresses or different addresses may map to a single host. And this has to do with what we mentioned earlier on. The systems are multiple addresses in the same log, in the same platform. I can see activities carried out by multiple IPv6 addresses, but this does not mean that they are different IPv6 addresses. And then we can do things in the opposite direction. They have multiple network activities all carried out with the same IPv6 address. Do they correspond to the same system? And in practice, that is not the case. This is because they have some things as load balancing. There are things like NAT and IPv6. Is Whether this is recommended or not, well, that's another issue, but it does exist. And a very practical example, namely, if we look at a typical implementation of Kubernetes, normally they use ULAs, which are private addresses, plus NAT. So this is not an argument in favor. This is just a fact describing what we might come across. So for good or for bad, when we detect multiple activities with the same origin address, this needn't imply that this is the same system. Now, all these ideas are fundamental when doing network operations, but we will be carrying out activities or we'll be applying access control rules that are based on the addresses and what is supposed that these addresses identify. Let us now 
look at those two large areas which you mentioned, which is at risk and toll needs and network correlations in order to identify and discuss the challenges we face in those areas. The first would be what we call the ACLs or the access control list, the allow list, namely to allow the access to a resource or a system or a group of systems. Now, what is the problem that we have here? If we were to migrate or to apply a knowledge of the IPv4 world to the IPv6 world, we would be applying these roles in specific addresses. This would be a slash 128, what we would be doing in IPv4. Now, as I mentioned earlier on, in most of the implementations, they use what we call temporary addresses. And the systems configure and regenerate the addresses over time. So the addresses are changing all the time with a given regularity. Now, these addresses are normally selected from a slash 64. And if I have multiple systems in the same subsystem of slash 64, I will see that all the addresses are mixed up, are intermingled. So the system I wish to give access to, but in the same address space, I have that of other ad addresses, which I don't want to give access to, and these change all the time. So the question is, if I would like to create an allow list, what should I allow? Because if I would configure a rule to allow a slash 128, if that system changes the address, then the ACL might fail. Now, this is describing the challenge we face. What is the case of the block list? For those of you who work in security teams or in operations, normally, we have a series of platforms where we can learn or where we can identify addresses that are having malicious behaviors. There are multiple ways to do so. In some cases, you might have some kind of CM which report those addresses that are having uh, supposedly malicious behavior. And if you want to take this to a more elemental level, some people use software which is like field to ban namely that they detect when there is an attempt to an incorrect access and after a number of incorrect attempts that access is blocked or, or they could also use some kind of ip reputation services whichever this would be could be now in any of these cases the output of any of these tools is one single ipv6 address the address that is behaving inadequately that I wish to block. Yes. Now the question is, if any of these tools re uh, give me an address that uh, is allegedly uh, behaving in a malicious way, what is it that I should block? If we were to migrate the same techniques that usually you apply in IPv4 world, I would block that single address so that you would be applying what you know in IPv4. But there, that's the challenge precisely. I just mentioned that typically in the IPv6 world, any user can control at least a slash 64, at least. And there are many um, uh, 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 providers that are free of charge that even allow the users to have a slash 48 if their ISP don't provide it. So what's the problem here? If I were just to block a slash 48, but I have to deal with an attacker that has some knowledge of IPv6, then the attacker should could do it very simply and would change uh, the uh, addresses with which, for, through which they attack. They could start an attack uh, with uh, one address and then go on to others. There are uh, um, tools already available for that. So if you use something as uh, uh, as common as a fit to one, never a tool uh, like that probably would never achieve uh, their um, uh, their aim because the attacker would change the the. Uh, 
their attacker constantly. So the attackers can do many things, sometimes uh, intentionally and sometimes as collateral result. The first is uh, to change uh, the rules for uh, access control. Uh, uh, that you had configured, so that is no longer effective. Now, there are other things that you can do. Depending on uh, the implementation that you're using, the attacker could uh, change um, the address intentionally so that uh, to um, change the rules that your device supports. I change my address in that slash 64, and if the implementation is not appropriate, then you will be creating more and more rules of access control until a certain time the device crashes or operates in an unexpected manner. So again, this is the challenge for the implementation of a control access, especially for block lists. And finally, of the cases that I had said initially, we have the correlation of network activities. And here, this is an exercise that is not trivial at all, because based on what I mentioned initially, it is difficult to identify, for instance, when I have one single IPv6 address, if it's only one device or if there are several. As a matter of fact, this is similar to the use of uh, IPv4 because of the use of NAT, but also, and this is maybe new, as usually in the IPv6 world, the attacker at least can control an entire slash 64, then I can see multiple addresses, for instance, in my security uh, platforms, and that doesn't mean that they are different systems. And it's not just a slash 64. It's very simple that an attacker, a user, may have access not just to a slash 64, but for instance, a slash 48 or even multiple slash 48. So it's difficult to identify when this is, if whether it's the same system or not. Now, let's go to a potential guideline guide. This is not a solution to the problem. I don't think that this is, should be done like this, but take it as a brainstorming. We, we need to assess it being the fact that uh, whether, regardless of whether the platforms that you use support it or not, the first is the allow list. The, uh, I wanted to enable access to certain systems with certain resources. What are the options here? Well, the problem originally, we saw it because we had temporary addresses in the same slash 64 changing all the time. The solutions here are quite obvious. Option one, to leave the temporary addresses aside. If the problem is that they're constantly changing, changing then maybe they shouldn't change. One of the ways you can implement this type of uh, 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 control, control of access list then is to use employee stable addresses. You have many possibilities using manual configuration, using DHCP version 6 or using Slack or auto configuration, but with some policies, for instance, group uh, um, to disable temporary addresses. So there I will know that the addresses are stable and I can specify that uh, rule for access control as a slash 128 because they don't change. The other option is to say, well, I don't want to disable the temporary addresses. I'm going to enable addresses to change and then the only choice that I will have is to segregate the systems so that they are in different slash 64s. So in the same slash 64, that system will change its addresses. But as I know that in each slash 64, I have one single system. I just implement the ACL based on the slash 64, and the problem is solved. As all, in, as in all these issues, some people say, well, what is the uh, best solution? I don't know whether there's a perfect solution, but I'm just putting several solutions on the table. Now let's go to the block lists. Here we have 
two types of problems that I just mentioned. On the one hand, we, we want to prevent the attackers to evade, to dodge the uh, control uh, rules. So if I see an IEP address that is doing a malicious activity, I want to avoid it just by changing the uh, address. Uh, they may dodge my security measures. The other issue is that given that the attacker could change uh, the addresses all the time and potentially could also deploy multiple ACLs in a system, I need to find some way to add, to aggregate those ACLs, of summarizing them, so to speak. Here you have a way that could be done. If you wanted to do that sort of thing, it could be something of this kind. So the values, I just uh, pull them off my sleeve. Um, it's and you, you, this is just as, please consider this just as an example. The, the idea is to have different levels of aggregation here, have one, two, three, four. And obviously level one is the most specific. Um, it's on slash 128, then slash 64, 56, and 48, and levels one, two, three, four. And the idea is more or less the following. I have a system that reports an address that's having a malicious activity, I'm going to create an ACL with a slash 128. But the idea is that as I create or I configure new AS ACLs, if I happen to have multiple slash 128 within a slash 64, what I'm going to do is to summarize those rules into a single one. Obviously, this, this doesn't come for free because I'm I'm creating a new rule with more granularity, so there would be a collateral effect that would mean be to block uh, addresses that basically do not have a legitimate activity. The idea, or in principle, the issue is that to the extent granularity is lesser, that I'm uh, blocking more things, you would always want the rule to last less because the collateral effect may be greater. So again, the values that you have here, uh, 10 or one hour of whatever, that is just, uh, these are, it's not that these are the recommended values, nothing of that kind. There are some implementations that do this sort of thing, not necessarily with these values. So these are the rules for control of access. And the only thing that we needed to discuss was the correlation between network activities. This is difficult, if you wish. The minimum thing that you can expect of the platforms or the tools that you use is to have a support search where the tool not just reports or identifies activity coming from the same system based on slash 128, but that you can configure that. So you may say, for instance, well, I'm, I'm going to assume that the attacker is controlling a slash 64, so any activity originating from an address of that slash 64, I consider that it's the same attacker. Again, here, there's there are no silver bullets. Um, take this not just uh, as carved in stone, but rather as brainstorming. Uh, but I think that we need to work uh, more with, on this. So this, this is being uh, um, analyzed by the OPSEC group of IETF. So basically, the differences in the two protocols, IPv4 and IPv6, but more specifically, the characteristics for uh, addressing, they have concrete uh, implications on security operations. So the people that are in the teams, they, they do not focus on IPv6, for instance, in security groups or there are cloud uh, teams that uh, don't consider them. The differences may not be obvious. As a matter of fact, some years ago, I thought that it was a new thing, and I was at a meeting with contents providers where they debated the security issues, and I asked, how do you implement ACLs? And they said, a slash 128, and they said, but if the attacker changes the address, and I said, oh, you're right. So I think it's good to have this topic under the radar, at least to know the limitations 
that these techniques may have in IPv6, not because they are limited, but because they may need some sort of change of how we conduct activities, in, and in some cases, because they may request uh, some additional features in the platforms we use. And the message somehow in security operations, these differences in the protocols between IPv4 and IPv6 may require or require some changes to be able to uh, use them correctly. Any questions? Obviously, there was going to be a slide making reference to the World Cup. Yes, Junior is here. And then there is a remote question here on the computer. Hello. I'm a junior of Teleki in Brazil. What do you think about DDoS attacks in IPv6? Have you had any cases in your experience? What do you think of it? The only difference that you may have between the two protocols has to do, let me give you a concrete case that is well known, and it has to do with the famous extension headers. That is the mechanism that IPv6 has to add options. One of the problems related with those extension headers is that you have many platforms that are unable to process those extension headers in the fast path. So you have a window for DDoS that you didn't have in IPv4. In the implementations that do not process those headers in the fast path. Now, in as to attacks in general, you don't have any differences with IPv4 unless, and let's go back to the beginning, if the technique or the security control that you apply to mitigate those DDoS attacks is based on blocking. Um, private accounts, you need to consider that the attacker has a much broader availability of addresses. So if you're just going to block a slash 128 or a prefix, but don't not as short with such a large space, then it's simple for the attacker to basically avoid or to uh, dodge your block. Thank you. We have three questions via Zoom. There are two by Henry Godoy and one uh, Asael Fernandez. Henry Godoy says, the firewall is not operating with IPv6 ACLs and my security breach uh, analysis uh, doesn't identify. What do you do? Would it be dangerous to implement IPv6? How do I see it pragmatically? In most cases, it's unavoidable. In most cases, you can't avoid it. What would you do in that case? Well, contact your vendor and request them to give you support they need. And the same with the example I gave with the previous question. There are many vendors that this is implemented by the software. So this is something you have to check with your vendor and that they implement the adequate IPv6 support. There's a second question from Asael Fernandez, who said, what would you recommend for those who consider using ULA addresses to be protected against those who have global addresses? Well, this is something that is quite controversial. We could discuss this for five days on end. Now, in principle, you, you can talk for 20 years on this, but in principle is not to use a combination of ULA plus NAT. Now, what on earth do we make all the effort of deploying IPv6 if I will end up putting private addresses together with NAT? Now, Eula, I'm going to give you an example to answer the question. If you were to have a network which you wish to be isolated with what we call air gap, which would not be exactly like that, and you only wish it to have a local connection 
and if you can have a lot of scenarios like that or not, well, that would be a case to use EULA. Not to use OLA plus NAT, but using OLA on its own because what you want is to have local connectivity. The other point is that regarding your question, how do I apply security? Well, the thing is quite simple. Instead of basically depending on what in IP SOOKs for, for sorry, implied depending on the NAT is to configure a firewall. So, in practical terms, you can obtain the same type of protection, not depending on having private addresses, but rather on covering a filtering policy that is adequate. We now have a last question, and very rapidly from Henry Godoy. He says, "Great presentation, Fernando." A great difficulty is to use ASLs for temporary addresses. I haven't found a simple way to deal with this topic. A port knocking, could that work? A port knocking, could that work? Well, I have this concept, but it's a personal idea. I think that complexity is an enemy of security, and I think port knocking has to do with complexity and I wouldn't follow that path. It goes against security and makes things more complex without many gains. So having done that, we'll be closing Fernando Gon's presentation and ask his to give him an applause. If you have more questions, he will be around during the plenary.